welcome to the Stranger Times podcast. I'm author CK slash Queen McDonald or Miss Jackson if you're nasty. God, do you remember when Janet Jackson's nipple was all the world talked about for a week? They were simpler, happier, nipplier times. These days, not only do people not mind boobs running amok, they've even let one be in charge of the entire British government. Boom, cutting edge political satire straight out the gate. You are welcome world. Uh, Anyway, this week's story is read by light entertainer Michael Legg. The most contrary so-and-so ever to come out of Northern Ireland, and that really is saying something. He is a wonderfully acerbic stand-up comedian, and recently he destroyed our friendship by becoming competition, when he launched his own book called Strawberries to Pigs. It is a collection of his writing, and if reading a middle-aged man getting hilariously angry about stuff is your bag, then I highly recommend it. As for the story, it's called The Trouble With Me Last Week, and it might be familiar to some of you who are hardcore readers of my work. Basically, it's been in the old uh, How to Send a Message collection there for a couple of years. It's technically not canon in the Stranger Times world. And by the way, I genuinely just did quotation marks with my fingers in the air around a microphone. I hate myself on so many levels. Anyway, uh, but yes, I was trying to say it's technically not canon in the Stranger Times world, if you care about such things. But it is Stranger Times adjacent. Basically, it's a sort of sci-fi fantasy story that I wrote, which is frankly close enough. And it's my podcast. I'll put it in if I want. And if you don't like it, go start your own podcast. Phew, that got a bit uh, heated. Anyway, everyone relax, except Michael Legg. The man doesn't do that, which is why, when listening to his angry little voice one day, I thought he would be absolutely perfect to read this story. And if I do say so myself, I was dead right. So without further ado, take it away, Michael Legg, light entertainer, an angry, angry man. Mark took a breath, looked around and drank in the view. He couldn't remember when he'd last felt this relaxed. It'd been an odd few days. He had to admit, every time he killed himself, it seemed to be getting easier. Last Thursday night, he'd been sitting alone in his lab in a bad mood, inputting data into the computer simulation of a Van Bruder wormhole that formed the core of his PhD. Before she'd gone down to visit her sister in Birmingham, Jessica and him had had an argument. It was about nothing, which was bad. If it was about something, it was fixable, but if it was just a result of their general frustration, a symptom of a relationship in its death throes, there wasn't anything that could be done, at least not by a clueless idiot like him. Mark knew Jessica was way out of his league, and deep down, he knew she knew it too. Everyone else sure did. People even pointed it out to him like they were congratulating him, not realising they were just adding to his terrible sense of unease. He'd caught her on the rebound and against all odds had clung on for over two years. But lately, it felt like his luck was finally running out. He spent his days waiting for the other shoe to drop. This paranoia manifested itself paradoxically with him being a passive-aggressive arse to Jessica. It was like his subconscious was trying to get its retaliation in first. With all this in mind, it was no surprise he'd messed up. He'd input entirely the wrong equation into the simulation and hence was asking it entirely the wrong question. This question was so monumentally ludicrous that nobody had ever thought of asking it before. It came back with an answer that rewrote some of the bigger laws of physics, not to mention making Einstein look like a bit of a dick. The first time he'd read through the results, Mark hadn't understood them. The second time, he hadn't believed them. The third time, he suspected foul play. But who would mess with his simulation? He shared the lab with Toshiko and Daniel. Toshiko was a foreign exchange student that rarely spoke to either of her lab mates, but she was unlikely to go messing with his stuff. She didn't do fun. Daniel, on the other hand, did nothing but. He was Mark's friend and, with the best will in the world, a moron. All right, he obviously had a brain, but it seemed to rest mainly in screensaver mode. It's amazing what cramming for the odd exam and being captain of the university's first ever championship winning rugby team can do for you. Mark knew he should resent Daniel. He had, after all, been gifted a scholarship that Mark had sweated buckets for. But it'd be like kicking a puppy. Besides. Daniel did liven the place up, spending his days engaged in an elaborate prank war with the microbiologists upstairs. 
Only this morning, they'd come in to find one of their rabbits hopping about the lab. Daniel had christened it Spartacus and spent the day feeding it to Chico's lunch. Shit, that was it. The bloody microbiologist had messed up his model, the petty little... Even as he thought it, he realised it couldn't be true. Daniel was at least technically doing a physics PhD and he didn't understand Mark's simulation enough to screw it up. There's no way the bunny boilers would. Mark's mind was racing now. If he was right, using the materials that were in the room with him at that very moment, it would be possible to build a device to send someone or something back in time. Time travel. The first time he allowed those words to form in his head, it felt ridiculous. But then he'd gone over the figures again and again. He needed to test it. He could build a simple prototype and then send something back. Not a person, that'd be crazy, but the rabbit. Of course, the perfect subject. The thought walloped into him like an articulated lorry travelling at full speed. Shit the bed! What'd Daniel say? The bunny boilers that refused to take Spartacus back insisted they weren't missing a rabbit. In a daze, Mark walked over to the storage container that Daniel was using as an improvised hutch. He lifted the rabbit up and felt around his collar. There it was. A white cylindrical object about the size of an AA battery with a button on the top. Written on it in a familiar hand was MMC 12 Dash 11 dash 20. He felt suddenly dizzy. Mark McCormick, 12th November 2020. Not only could he build a time machine, he already had. Four days from now. Then he'd stolen a rabbit from the bunny boilers and sent it back in time to arrive sometime between 10 p.m. last night and 8.15 a.m. this morning when Toshiko found it. Reactions to moments of absolute genius have varied throughout history. Running naked down the street was a popular one, if a little showy. Mark went the more traditionally Irish route and decided to get blindingly drunk. It was 9.37 p.m. and he knew Daniel would be in the uni bar, having his weekly argument at the pub quiz. He joined him and without any explanation started buying drinks. Lots and lots of drinks. Big drinks, little drinks, drinks inside other drinks. Drinks that were on fire. He was celebrating. Today was the last day of his old life. The first day of his new life got off to a very bad start. He woke up in his bed beside a girl called Sabina, a third year in applied physics whose labs he and Daniel were forced to supervise as part of their PhDs. Her distinctive pink hair looked in Congress on Jessica's pillow. Mark's whole existence froze in a moment of gut-wrenching terror, only slightly relieved when he remembered that Jessica was away down south. Nevertheless, he had made a truly terrible mistake. It was clear that last night they'd at least tried to have sex. Badly, no doubt. But Mark didn't think you regained lost points in this situation for having performed inadequately in your act of abject betrayal. It said something for the level of shame and skull-splitting hangover he was experiencing that it took him a good minute to notice the smell. As well as making the terrible mistake of bringing someone to bed with him, it seemed he'd had another terrible mistake while asleep. He couldn't bring himself to lift the duvet and look down. Today could not get any worse. It quickly did. He turned as he felt Sabina stirring into blurry-eyed life beside him. For lack of any better ideas, he smiled at her. She didn't smile back. She took a couple of moments to look around the room, to drink in the reality of where they were and what it meant. Mark watched her thought process play out across her face. He saw the exact moment the smell from below the duvet hit. She promptly threw up all over him. Mark lay there covered in his own filth, her vomit and their collective shame as, sobbing, Sabina gathered up all of her clothing that she could find 
and quickly fled. Neither of them said anything. Some situations there really are no words for. Once it had become painfully clear that, despite his fervent wishes, he wasn't going to die, he got out of bed. He clambered into the shower for an hour where he cried and threw up a couple of times. He spent the rest of Friday lying naked on a sofa. Their sofa. Feeling like the lowest of the low. Yes, he'd also made one of the greatest discoveries in the history of science, but he was in no fit state to think about that now. Saturday morning, he awoke to a truly pugnant smell and the horrific idea that he'd somehow reenacted the most shameful night of his life. He hadn't. What he'd done is refuse to face up to the consequences of that night, which is why the stench from the bedroom was now pervading the whole flat. He got dressed and, retching, threw all of the unspeakable mess into two bin bags. He passed Mrs. Ince on the way down to the big bins behind the building. Upon smelling him, her wrinkled old face formed into such a disgusted scowl it looked like it was trying to eat itself. The whole flat stank. He opened every window and spent several hours cleaning, but the smell seemed as determined to hang around as the shame. Now that the previous day's apocalyptic hangover had passed, the guilt had the freedom to run amok in his sodden mind and it was taking full advantage. That took up most of Saturday. He sat on the sofa eating toast while his mind swapped between rerunning the shameful highlights of Thursday night and generating worst case scenarios to fill in the parts of the evening he'd blacked out. He nodded off and awoke screaming at 2am from a dream he remembered all too well. Apparently, his subconscious had thought of something it couldn't bring to his overworked conscious mind's attention, which was why he'd been chased around his own head by a massive baby with pink hair, carrying a pack of condoms, screaming, Why, Daddy, why? He ran through scenarios in his mind. He was in absolutely no doubt that as soon as Jessica got within five yards of the door when she returned, She'd sense his guilt, not to mention smell it. His best idea was setting the flat on fire. But he'd risk burning down the whole building. The idea of Mrs. Ince glaring her disapproval at him while being engulfed in flames just didn't appeal. How could this have happened? How could his penis have so brutally betrayed his heart? His penis was a total... It was at this moment he realised why slang terms for the male genitalia were appropriately used as insults. Penises really were the absolute worst, and none more so than his. There was nothing for it. Full and total confession. He had to tell Jessica everything before she got home, and the true horror slapped her right in the nostrils. The more he thought about it, telling her everything, apologising and showing her how much he wanted to fix it, that had to be the way to go, didn't it? Also, on an evolutionary level, her realising he was a desirable mate to other females, that could swing things in his favour, couldn't it? That's just basic biology. Besides, throwing himself at her mercy, telling her she meant the world to him, wasn't that just a little bit romantic? Sunday morning. He summoned up all his courage and rang Jessica. In hindsight, leaving a voicemail was a big mistake. In fairness to him, he realised that halfway through and started apologising for the voicemail while he was leaving it, meaning that the apology for the infidelity had to be covered in voicemails 2 through 4. Voicemail 5 was an apology for everything, while 6 was an ill-judged attempt to play the whole thing off as a joke. Seven through nine were really voicemails two through four reworked to no noticeable improvement. After that, he stopped leaving voicemails, but kept ringing. She never picked up, but at a certain point, it changed to going straight to voicemail. By 11pm, she'd not returned home. Maybe something terrible had happened. Even as he thought this, he was ashamed as a wave of relief washed over him. If Jessica had been hit by a car, she might not have listened to her voicemails. He could delete them and be the loving boyfriend who nursed her back to health. He'd spend every day of the rest of his life making her the happiest woman alive. 
just as soon as he figured out how to do that. Now, paranoid about Jessica's well-being, he decided to ring her sister, Claire. If he'd been asked before that phone call, he'd have said without hesitation that he was his own biggest critic. It turned out he'd have been entirely wrong in that assessment. From being talked at by Claire, it quickly became apparent that Jessica had not only heard the voicemails, but that they'd actually gone down a lot worse than he'd feared. She wouldn't speak to him. She may have been sobbing in the background, but it was impossible to hear over her sister's invective-laden demolition of his character, not to mention a graphic description of things that would happen to him and his genitalia that was way too specific and elaborate to have been thought up entirely on the spot. He spent Sunday night on the sofa, unsuccessfully attempting to get drunk on Ouzo, the only booze left in the flat, an unloved refugee from last year's holiday in Crete. If only he'd not... Well, everything. Everything that had happened in the last... In Mark's defence, when the thought suddenly struck him at 4am, he did realise how blindingly obvious it had been. He was the only man in the world who could really take it back. This had to be destiny, didn't it? He rolled over and slept the sound slumber of a guilty man who would soon become innocent again. He was woken up the next morning by Jessica returning to grab some clothes. She had Gareth, her burly brother-in-law, for company. Mark and Gareth had never got along, and it was to Jessica's credit that she only let the big Welshman punch him once. As he knelt on the carpet, clutching his freshly traumatised testicles and looking into the tear-stained eyes of the woman he loved, he swore he would fix this. She just swore, using a selection of words he'd frankly never realised she knew, much less being able to form into some very vivid sentences. When he'd regained the ability to walk, Mark got dressed and hopped on his bike. He quickly realised that it was a far from ideal mode of transportation in his current state of testicular tenderness, but time was of the essence. When he reached the lab, he rushed to his desk. The white cylindrical device was still locked in his drawer exactly where he'd left it. Sure, he could have built another one, but there was no guarantee it'd work the same. Perhaps this one was a happy accident in much the same way as his initial discovery had been. This gave him pause for thought. Could he be certain this would work? Yes, it had worked on Spartacus, but Mark was considerably bigger than a rabbit. Come to that, how did he know it had really worked on the rabbit? He gave Spartacus, still in his supposedly temporary accommodation beside Daniel's desk, an appraising look. He didn't look mentally or physically impaired, but then, what did a mentally impaired rabbit look like? Yes, on one hand, the plan was very high risk, but on the other hand, he'd shat the bed, both metaphorically and literally. He checked his watch. He didn't even know exactly how far the rabbit had been sent back. It had been approximately four days, but that meant he could already be too late. He strode purposefully over to Toshiko's workstation, where she was industriously beavering away with that look of absolute concentration she always wore. Mark cleared his throat dramatically. Toshiko, I know we don't know each other very well, but I have to go somewhere and, while I hope this isn't the case, I may not be back. I have some things I need to say and I need you to please pass on these words to my loved ones, okay? She regarded him suspiciously before giving him a curt nod. Mark closed his eyes and spoke from the heart. He was profound, sincere, even funny in places. This was really good stuff. He was being downright eloquent. Where had this guy been when he was leaving nine disastrously inept voicemails for the woman he loved? He wondered if perhaps he should record this as... Mark opened his eyes to find that Toshiko had wandered off. He really didn't like her. Screw it! He looked at the device and with a deep breath, pressed the button. Nothing happened. He examined it more closely and discovered it needed to be twisted to spring the button into the fully upright position. That made sense. It obviously needed a safety mechanism. He mentally congratulated the version of him that had actually built it on this entirely sensible piece of design. That was a good point. 
If he was now here on the day Spartacus had originally been sent back, who made the device? Figuring that out would take some serious thought about the nature of time. Causality, stuff like that. He didn't have that kind of time. He took a deep breath and pressed the button again. The lights went out and Mark felt a sensation like every molecule in his body jumping two feet to the left. For a moment, he thought he'd blown a fuse in the lab, but then he noticed that it was dark outside the windows too. He'd just become the first human in history to travel backwards through time. He instantly regretted not doing it in front of Toshiko while saying something devastatingly witty like, Time flies. No, time to go or time waits for no man. Okay, maybe he was better just going. He found his way to his workstation and checked the time. 4.27am, Thursday the 7th of November 2020. It had been about 11.15am on Monday the 11th when he pressed the button. That meant the device had sent him back about 4 days, 6 hours and 48 minutes. He'd have to leave the main lights off. He didn't want to get thrown out by campus security. His bed was currently occupied. That was a thought. He was about to have his second go at the 7th of November, but his first attempt was still out there, sleeping amidst unsullied sheets with the woman he loved. He felt a pang of jealousy. It dawned on him that he just effectively invented cloning as well. He was really racking up the giant leaps forward in scientific understanding this week. Suck on it, Einstein! Mark had a few hours to kill, so googled when the nominations for the Nobel Prize for Physics closed. Damn it, September. He'd have to wait until next year's. He then looked up time travel paradoxes on physics forums. There was a school of thought that said that if he were ever to meet himself, the universe would implode. That was worrying. But then, most of the people who thought that also didn't seem to be able to get over Sabrina the Teenage Witch being rebooted. Surely, if that was going to happen, it would have done so when two versions of Spartacus had existed in the same time stream. Hey, that was a point. Where was... Before Mark could finish the thought, there was a sizzling noise, and the rabbit popped into being on the workbench beside him. It was a coincidence, but the week he was having, it didn't feel like it was worth thinking about. Two separate versions of the future were now effectively looping back into his present. He made what felt like a sensible decision in the circumstances, to just roll with it and assume everything would be fine. Experts could hypothesise all they liked, but seeing as he had actually invented time travel, surely his opinion counted for more. He stole Toshiko's biscuits from her desk and downloaded an illegal copy of Back to the Future for himself and Spartacus to kill some time watching. The main message of the film seemed to be, if you travel back in time, don't sleep with your mother. Mark couldn't help but think the first half of that sentence was entirely redundant. Toshiko chained her bike up outside the sciences building at exactly 8.15am, same as always. Two minutes later, as she was busy glaring at the empty packet of biscuits on her desk, Mark was busy borrowing her bike with a spare key she kept in her filing cabinet. He considered it karmic payback for her walking out on his awesome death speech. Although, yes, this version of Toshiko had not technically done that. Her bike was a bit small, but on the upside, it did have a nice wicker basket for Spartacus to sit in. He decided to take the rabbit with him, feeling a bond between them that nobody else could ever fully understand. He was aware that he was technically altering the course of history and yada yada yada, but he didn't care. He'd have to do a whole lot more messing with recent history before the night was over. Causality could go take a running jump. While it made sense to get far away from the university to minimise the opportunities for further complications, he'd nowhere in particular to go. He didn't have a fully formed plan yet, but he realised that whatever needed to happen couldn't happen before the time was right. And so... He and Spartacus spent a rather nice day down wandering about the northern quarter. They played games in the arcades, perused the shops, caught a regrettable Adam Sandler film, and then ate a delicious Thai meal. 
it struck Mark that, now that he had a second chance at life, he should do something similar with the female human he loved as soon as possible. And so it was at 9.32pm. Through the small glass window in the lab door, Mark watched the version of himself who, for the sake of his own mental health, he was thinking of as past Mark, make the greatest discovery in the history of human science. He'd been planning this moment all day, running through snappy opening lines he could use. With Spartacus in his arms, he theatrically walked through the door and promptly got covered in red paint. Ah, for f- Mark looked up at the pot of paint dangling upside down over the door. His past self gawped at him in disbelief. It was the weirdest of sensations, like seeing someone you've known all your life and at the same time not quite being able to place them. You're, the past stammered. Yeah, you, from the future. Why am I covered in bloody paint? Past Mark stood and started backing away. Um, Daniel booby trapped it because the bunny boilers broke in last night and stole Toshiko's biscuits? Well, you've ruined one of the greatest moments in history. I hope you're happy, Mark snapped. It shouldn't have gone off yet. Daniel said it would be harmless until I... The past trailed off, staring at his future self in a way that was increasingly irritating Mark. Th- this isn't possible, the past stammered. Mark pointed at the computer. It is? You've just seen that it is? If you're me, what number am I thinking of right now? How the fuck would I know? I'm you from next Monday. You don't develop psychic powers over the weekend. Mark realised his temper was further ruining the moment, but he'd just noticed that poor Spartacus's white fur was now matted with red paint. The bunny had a sorrowful look in his eyes. So you're you from about five days in the future, and this is Spartacus, a formerly white rabbit. Mark stopped himself and took a breath. Something was wrong, very wrong. None of this was going the way it should. It felt like there was a dark, portentous cloud hanging over them, an oppressive electrical tension in the air that indicated a storm was coming. Two versions of the same person being in the same place in the same time, hadn't caused the universe to implode, but it didn't mean it was happy about it. They say nature abhors a vacuum. Maybe it's none too keen on repeats either. Mark took a deep breath. Time to calm down and regain control of the situation. Okay, look, I know it sounds crazy, but you've discovered time travel and yes, I am you from the future. Shut the bed! Do not say that! Past Mark backed away nervously. Why are you here? For a lack of a better idea, Mark told the truth. He looked at the floor and, as calmly as he could, he explained it all. Jessica, Sabina, the voicemails, the weekend of bad decisions and bodily functions that had led to him losing the woman he loved. Saying it all out loud made his heart ache all over again. When he'd finished, he looked up to see the disconcerting sight of his own face sneering at him in disgust. I can't believe you did that! The thunder roared and the clouds opened. It happened fast, too fast. It was Mark's first fight since primary school. What it lacked in technique, it made up for in sheer brutality. They were crazed animals. His past sunk his teeth into his neck. Mark gouged at an eye in response and reveled in the subsequent scream. A flailing knee connected with his genitals, still bruised and sore from earlier that day and another life. Before he knew what was happening, the past had a chokehold on him and he was gasping for breath while colours flashed before his eyes. He staggered, unable to shake his limpet-like twin as they clattered back and forth against the workbenches. As the light faded, his desperately grasping hands found something. Toshiko's oscilloscope, a two foot by six inch metal box for measuring voltage. He heaved it over his left shoulder and heard a sickening crunch as it made contact with bone. The other mark fell to his knees, hands holding his face from which blood was now pumping. 
Mark raised the oscilloscope and brought it crashing down. And again. And again. All he could see was that look in Jessica's eyes as she'd walked out of his life for good. At some point, he must have slipped in the blood because when the oscilloscope came down for the last couple of times, he was on his knees. He was dimly aware that it was making an increasingly loud noise. As he started to lose consciousness, he realised it was because there was now precious little skull left between it and the floor. He flopped over onto his side. The floor tile felt cool against his skin. It hurt to breathe and his throat made a weird clicking noise every time he did. The last thing he recalled was watching Spartacus hop across his field of vision, leaving a trail of bloodied footprints behind him. Mark's own voice echoed in his head. Wake up! Wake up! Wake the fuck up! Cold water hit him in the face, jarring him awake. He opened his eyes and images began to slowly swim into focus. Someone was standing over him. It was... him. Oh, thank God! I thought I'd... The other Mark spoke in a calm voice. Killed me? No. He moved to the side and Mark saw the bloody mess on the floor. A body with most of its head gone. But here's one you prepared earlier. Mark stared out of the rain-splattered window at the lights of the passing cars as Spartacus nuzzled against his chest. Once, future Mark had got through with the explanation. There had not been a lot else to say, and they were understandably keen to avoid any possibility of a confrontation. He was still woozy from his injuries, and the unpleasant clicking noise remained each time he drew breath. As the future explained it, The last time around, Mark awoke at 11.46pm to the screams of Margot, one of the microbiologists from upstairs, who'd come in to put mice in Daniel's desk, only to be confronted by a bloodbath. He had tried to explain, but she'd run away, and in a state of panic, Mark had run too. He'd headed for his own flat initially, lying on the sofa and replaying in horrific detail the memories of the madness. As the adrenaline wore off, he threw up the Thai meal from earlier. About 3am, he'd got out of his flat, realising just in time that the police would soon be pointed in that direction. He hid out in Alexandra Park, hopping the fence. He washed himself as best he could in the pond. The next morning, he'd watched from the laneway across the street as a police car had pulled up to Daniel's house and he'd gone off with them, looking pale. When Daniel had returned that afternoon, unbeknownst to him, Mark was hiding in his attic, having led himself into the empty house with the spare key. Mark listened quietly as his friend explained everything to his housemate, Billy, when he'd returned from lectures. Mark was dead. They'd done DNA tests on the body. Daniel had cried as he told Billy how, at least initially, he'd clearly been a suspect in his best friend's murder. Finally, they'd managed to verify that he'd been at a pub quiz the night before. Luckily, his presence had been memorable, as he had been ejected for Googling. Mark had wanted to go down and explain it all to Daniel there and then, but he didn't. He couldn't. He tried to use the device several times since what happened in the lab, but it hadn't worked. He had a theory he was clinging to, hoping against hope he was right. Otherwise, he was set for another first, being the first man put on trial for his own murder. Luckily, Daniel went home to be with his family and Billy was off to Leeds for a dirty weekend. Mark knew this as he'd unwillingly overheard Billy's phone call with his girlfriend where he described the frankly impractical sexual acts he intended them to spend the weekend performing. Mark spent the weekend like a ghost in someone else's digs, watching news reports on the manhunt for his own killer. The Greater Manchester Police were clearly clueless, but they were making plenty of noise nevertheless. They couldn't let students get bludgeoned to death or else the psychos might move on to real people. Billy returned home on Sunday night by which time Mark was back in the attic. Having taken most of the remaining food in the house with him, Billy bitched and moaned about his useless housemate and then ordered a pizza. Later on, he had a frosty conversation with his soon-to-be former girlfriend. Apparently, her front teeth had made contact with a bedpost during coitus convolutatus and come off much the worse. Billy was arguing whether or not he should have to cover half of her dentist bill. 
Mark kill time until 4.22 a.m. Tuesday the 12th of November. Four days, six hours and 48 minutes after the horrific moments he'd relived over and over again in the last few days. All he had left was a theory. He pressed the button and was proven right. The device wouldn't let him go back to before the fight. Maybe no more than two iterations of a person could exist in the same time. Or maybe you could cheat time, but not death. And so, at 9.39pm, Thursday 7th of November, while Mark was bludgeoning his past self to death in their lab, his future self was popping back in time to Daniel's attic, just in time to hear Billy having a vigorous moment with himself while watching German porn on the internet. Mark guessed this was where Billy had got the truly dreadful idea of something new to try over the weekend that would result in him losing a girlfriend and her losing a tooth. Mark crept by Billy's bedroom door and grabbed the spare keys to Daniel's Skoda from the kitchen. Then he'd gone to the shed and taken Daniel's canvas surfboard carrying bag, a can of diesel, a shovel and some paint. Which is how, at 11.46pm, Margot, the microbiologist, had entered the physics lab to be covered in red paint from a refilled booby trap. Weirdly, the rest of the lab had red paint thrown all over it too which happened to cover any blood that might be knocking about from a body that was now in a surfboard bag in a Skoda's boot on its way up to the Lake District. Mark wordlessly shoveled some more dirt out of the makeshift grave. Future Mark had done most of the grunt work as he was still feeling lightheaded thanks to his injuries from the fight. Still, he felt he should do something so he'd offered to take over for the last bit. Digging a grave is surprisingly hard work. Even in the soft boggy ground they'd find so far off the beaten track, you could possibly build a house and nobody would see it. That's enough, I reckon, said future Mark. Mark looked down at the three foot deep hole he was now standing in and nodded in agreement. He climbed out. Future Mark extended a hand to help him and then thought better of it. They'd both avoided touching each other so far to be on the safe side. They heaved the surfboard bag into the hole and then looked at each other and then back at the makeshift grave. Shouldn't we, I don't know, say something? said Mark. I suppose so, agreed future Mark. You did. You've had more time to think about this than I have. Future Mark glared at him. He held his hands out in a placating gesture. I didn't mean anything by that. We're both. This is nobody's fault. Future Mark looked at his past self, remembering the horrors of the first night dealing with this, and took pity. He closed his eyes. <sighs> Our father. The shovel hit him square in the face. When the future came to, he felt his arms and legs bound with cord from the boot. He was lying on something lumpy. Of course he was. It was a surfboard bag containing most of a body. He looked up to see Mark standing over him and laughed through the shattered teeth. The hard, bitter laugh of someone who'd just gotten the joke and, while it wasn't that funny... It did at least make a twisted sense. Mark glared down at him. Be honest. You'd have done the same. It makes sense. We can only have one of us existing if it's to go back to the way it was. There can be only one. <laughs> the laughter and Highlander quotes were disconcerting. Mark was prepared for anger, pleading, but not that. Stop it. You don't get it, do you? You've got a great future behind you. Mark raised the shovel, closed his eyes, and finished it. Then he poured the diesel, started a fire, and watched it burn. He filled the hole in after. And so, ten days later, Mark stood and admired the view. He'd got the joke now. It was pretty damn funny. The last couple of weeks had proven two things. Firstly, that he had a spectacular capacity for screwing up. And secondly, he was ultimately willing to do whatever was necessary to fix it. Up to and including murder. And that was where the problem lay. The next time he screwed up, he'd do it again. He'd go back and fix the problem, like, just like he'd done twice already. How could he be protected from his own future self? Destroy the evidence? He could build another. Remain vigilant? You can't fool someone who remembers exactly what you did and has a whole four days, six hours and 48 minutes to figure out a way around it. 
Outrunning your own past is difficult. Outrunning your own future is damn near impossible. He had finally figured it out, the only way he could escape. He turned around and took a step backwards into nothing. As the wind rushed by his ears, he looked back up towards the bridge, where he could just make out the twitchy little ears of a white rabbit watching him fall. The third time was the easiest of all. Thank you for listening to the Stranger Times podcast. If you've enjoyed it, then please leave a rating wherever you get your pods. It really does help. And the Stranger Times novel by C.K. MacDonald is out and is available from all good bookshops and some bad ones. And check out thestrangertimes.com for more weird news and to sign up to the newsletter, where you can also get yourself a sweet free ebook containing some Stranger Times short stories. This podcast is produced by Rob B at BEE, with Ed Wilson exec producing, and all materials are copyright McFory Inc. Limited. <laughs>